Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Here's another reading of God's holy word. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. For, so he paid the fare and he went on board to go with them on their way, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. And they, and they threw the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down to the inner part of the ship, and had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we do not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. May God's blessing be upon us. And may God protect us from the enemy that would try to steal this word from us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we walk this Lenten journey together, as we take these next few weeks of preparation, as we move towards the cross of Jesus and to the celebration of Easter, we will be, one, looking at this book of Jonah, this book of the prophet Jonah. Four chapters. We're going to go over it for the next, this week and the four weeks after. So five weeks in the book of Jonah. I encourage you during the week, to, each week, just pick up the book and read it again. Um, and read it with a specific reading in mind. This week we're going to look at it, um, seeing the denial of Jonah. Next week it'll be anger. It's in your bulletin, the theme. Just reread it. It doesn't take long. You can split it up into four readings over the course of the week. But reread it because each time I believe you'll find a, a certain richness um, to what's happening there. So we're going to look at Jonah. We're going we're gonna to be on this Lenten journey, this, this journey where we, where we talk about denying something of ourselves so that we can be more in tune and more in a right relationship with Jesus Christ as we move towards the celebration of Easter and our understanding of the cross and the grave. And while we're doing all that, we're going to look at these five stages. I call them stages, and I think that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the woman who came up with these, a medical doctor in her work with hospice patients um, some years ago, would agree that there are stages in the sense that you move from one to the other cleanly, that you don't just kind of finish denial and move into anger and then quickly move on into a bargaining and then you're depressed and then you accept everything. It's not that simple. And those of us, which means most of us who have dealt with the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship, the brokenness of something, those of us who have sat and have been in the presence of a doctor when they brought us a diagnosis of a terminal disease, for one of us, for someone we love, for someone in a professional capacity, and said, you have six weeks to live, six months to live, two years to live, five years to live. When they bring a terminal diagnosis, or just a diagnosis that says, from this point forward, your life will always be different. You'll never walk the same. You'll never eat the same. You'll never breathe the same. All of these have to do with death and dying. Sometimes it's the death of our body. Sometimes it's the death of the way we live. And all of these things we can understand because we, we go through them. And we work through these stages with all of our losses. And again, not cleanly. Sometimes we go through three or four of these stages simultaneous, simultaneously. Sometimes we go through all five of them within an hour or two for our purpose. 
purposes, though, we're going to just kind of take them and set them aside, each of them, for five weeks. With the understanding that we all have to go through this. That Jonah gives us some sense of what it means to, to do these things. And that we're in this journey to end Lent where we have been called to deny, to give up ourselves, so that we can live a life that's worthy of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So we, so we turn this morning to, to Jonah, um, a, 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 a different kind of prophet, to say the least. A prophet who was called to go and speak and share God's word with some pretty terrible people. The Ninevites. And I'm, I'm, going help, I'm going to try to explain who the Ninevites were without telling you who they were historically because I'm not sure if that matters so much to us today. Um, you, you can look it up, you can read it, it's all kind of interesting who they were. But the Ninevites to Jonah were the worst kind of people in the world. They were, they were the kind of people that would have put him down and his people down, who would have done everything they could to get rid of the Hebrew people, who would have stood against him. They were, they were, they were, they were a wretched lot of people. They were, they, were, they were terrible. They were awful. And I, I'll say this, that if you think about the, the group of people that you despise the most, you know, I don't despise anybody, but we all know that's not really true. There are people that we really don't like. Um, um, again, I would say I have a problem with child molesters. There's a whole group of people I really don't like. You may, you may have somebody else you don't like even more than that. You may have somebody you don't like because of their politics, because of their, because of their um, um, religious background, because of particular lifestyles they follow. You can just pick out the group of people you really don't like, that every time you see them or think about them, it makes your stomach kind of get in a knot. And multiply that by about a thousand. And now we're talking Ninevites. These are bad, bad people. Nothing, there's nothing kind to be said about the Ninevites. They don't, they don't, they don't do well historically. They're tough. They're like, they're like you know, today we use Nazis as the worst kind of people. They're like Nazis times Nazis. Like, they're, they're terrible people. <laughs> So you know what I'm talking about now. But, but interestingly enough, the book of Jonah has really not very much to do with the Ninevites. It's not a story about how bad they are. So I'm not even going to talk much more about how bad they are, except for this is that Jonah was called to go to somebody that he thought were a thousand times worse than anybody I can imagine being that man. And go and share God's word with them. And so Jonah got a particular diagnosis for himself. The diagnosis was, you're a prophet, and it's your time to go, and now you're being called to go. He got another diagnosis, you're going to go to the most wicked people in the world of all time, forever and ever, no problem. And you're going to go to them. Jonah did not like the diagnosis. Did not like it one bit. He wanted a second opinion. A third opinion. He didn't like his second opinion, or third opinion, or fourth opinion. So he said, I'm not going to even listen to you. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to run away. He was in complete denial to the point where he went to Joppa, which is a very much a non-Hebrew, non-Israel, non-Jewish port. Figuring if I go there, God won't be there. And when I got, he got there, he found a boat. He told them what he was doing. I'm fleeing from my God. He got on the boat, and he wanted to go to the ends of the earth. Figuring that would be far enough away from God. So jo Jonah's pretty interesting here. He's denying his calling. He's a prophet. He's denying who he is supposed to be. He is denying the diagnosis. He is denying God's omniscience and power, which he knows is true. He, he's, a, he's the one person in this whole story that knows that God is the God, the one God, the one true God, the living God, the God of Abraham, the God of the prophets, the God of our fathers. He knows this about God. He knows that God is not limited by how far a boat can go. But he denies this in, in order to think he can get away from God. He runs in the exact opposite direction. It, it, is this the man of denial? He does not want to go to be with those worst kinds of people. Let somebody else do it. Don't want to be there. So he's denying all along. He's denying. He's in such denial that when he gets on the boat and there's this big storm that's really upsetting, as my, as, as my translation says, the mariners are upset. 
People who are used to being on a ship and can deal with bad things happening, that this one's so bad that they're freaking out, that when the captain goes underneath and he sees Jonah asleep, and he says, what's wrong with you sleeper? Jonah's in such denial that he doesn't even care what's going on. We know this about Jonah, that Jonah says this throughout, basically he says it by his actions, his thoughts, his words, his deeds, that he would rather be dead than go to Nineveh. That death was a preferable option to him. But not for the reasons we would think. That death was a preferable option, but not for the reasons we would think. Because even as we think about today, um, the, those who would be willing to martyr them, to be martyrs, to, to die for the, the cause, even as we turn on the news and we read about Coptic Christians who are, who are being beheaded in, in, in Egypt, they were willing to die for what they believed in. They were willing to die because they were followers of Christ. A young woman who would go and put herself in harm's way knew going to where she was going that death was certainly a, a, a pretty, pretty tall option that might happen to her. She knew that, but she knew before she went that she had died for something to give her life to Christ. That is not what Jonah was doing. Jonah was not willing to die for God's cause. He would rather die than be a part of God's cause, which is a completely different thing. He would rather die than be a part of God's cause. And we know this because what Jonah says at the end of the book is what we don't know at the beginning, so I need to read the whole thing through, is Jonah says, you know, God, the real reason I didn't want to go to Nineveh is I know what kind of God you are. You're a God of mercy and grace. You're a God who says that I'm going to just destroy everything, but then turns around and doesn't do it. I didn't want to go because I didn't want to see your grace at work in their lives. Because those people are a thousand times worse than anything I can imagine. And I can't believe that you would be that nice to them. I can't believe you would offer them that kind of grace. Even though I expect that kind of grace in my life each and every day. I expect that kind of love in my life each and every day. I don't want them to get it. I don't want them to have this kind of grace. So Jonah denies his calling. He denies God what God is capable of, and he's willing to deny that people can receive God's grace. He does not want it to happen. He would prefer it didn't. We can learn a lot from Jonah. We'll talk about this. But what we learn early on is that this man, this prophet, is in complete denial. He's in complete denial. Unlike any other prophet, the other prophets, God would come to them and say, I want you to do this. And they wouldn't deny God and say, I don't want to do it. They'd say, are you sure, God, that I'm the right one? Can't, I mean, there's got to be somebody better. And God would say, of course you're the right one. And they would be okay. Not Jonah. John Jonah doesn't get into the bargaining with God on that. He just says right there, no, not me, somebody else. Pick somebody else. And we can recognize in ourselves where we would deny people God's grace. Where we would deny God's grace. Where we would even deny God because we don't want to go to those places. We don't want to find ourselves often where God is calling us to go. We would much rather stay right here. This is safe. This is nice. Don't call me God out into the world where people are broken and hurting. Don't call me to that place where, where the world is falling apart. Instead, keep me at home. Now, the interesting thing about Jonah, and this has happened but really the last two times I've even spent much time in Jonah as a preaching place. Um, the last time was about, I guess it was 12, 15 years ago, when we invaded Iraq as a country. I say we, I'm a United States citizen, we invaded Iraq as a country. And then I started working on this sermon series before Christmas. And so everything that's happening now had, had really begun to get so clear what was going on. One of the really interesting things about Nineveh is that Nineveh, if we knew where it was, we're kind of close on it. We don't know exactly the place it is. But Nineveh, if it was any place ever in the world, it was in northern Iraq. That's where it exists historically. Nineveh exists in northern Iraq. Probably one of the places we would say is one of the worst places in the world to go today. But some of the people who would hate me as much as anybody if I showed up looking like this, especially, and have real problems with me being here. And I, I don't know why that happened. I'm still trying to, I'm struggling with why I'm preaching Jonah during a time when I'm talking about Nineveh in northern Iraq. I'm, God's going to let me know why that's happening. Um, I, I'm 
I'm not tempting God I'm just hoping he's not calling me to go there because I'm going to be more like Jonah and say you don't really want to send me I want to go someplace else but the truth is most of us haven't been called to the very worst places in the world most of us have been called to just go around the corner and down the street and, and into the road most of us have been called to be missionaries much more close to home and we still deny it. And we still deny people grace. I shared this story at the, at the first service. I, I, I can tell you this week where I denied somebody grace pretty clearly. I was having a bad day on Friday. I was having a rough day. You know, my, my father-in-law is sick and he's come home and he needs medicine. And my twins, they're, 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 they're puking all over the place. I needed to get some medicine for them. I'm in line at CVS. Have you ever stood in line at CVS? It can be maddening. <laughs> It can be tough. And I gave them my medicines, and they, they said, come back in two hours. And I went back in two hours, and the medicine wasn't ready. And then some of them, they weren't even going to be ready until the next day at 2 o'clock. That's what they told me. I lost it. And the really sad part is, I took it out of this young lady standing behind the counter. I felt terrible afterwards. I felt pretty good and righteous about myself being mad at her then. Um, I didn't cuss. I didn't use it. I, 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 it might have been better off about it using foul language because it would have been easier to understand. I felt terrible. I was not willing to extend this young lady grace. Grace that I want myself. I'm not even worried about the Ninevites. I'm not worried about the people I really despise. This is just a girl doing her job. I felt so bad that I was back at CVS between the service apologizing. She wasn't there, but I was apologizing. Um, thank you. John Thomas, he saw me in there. My girlfriend was like, what are you doing? I'm apologizing for how awful I was on Friday um, and trying to pick up the medicine still. <laughs> <laughs> we do it all the time. We withhold grace. We deny what God will do for somebody else, but we expect it so much for ourselves. It's a hard thing to live in denial. But we find ourselves camped out there much like Jonah. And Jonah's a perfect example of, in this case, of what not to do. And the sad part for Jonah is that he's denying at the beginning and he's denying at the end. Jonah never really gets out of it. He kind of, he's stuck in the trap. He's, he's mad all the way throughout. But he's mostly mad because God, he sees a God that he loves and expects grace from. But he doesn't want anybody else to receive that grace. Especially those people. You know, those people. We all have those people. His were particular with those people. We have to be careful about that. About those people. Because those people who are the ones who need us to be them, be there for them most. And those people are probably the ones that God is calling us to go to. And unfortunately, when he does, we're oftentimes running in the opposite direction. I pray, I pray Mary and then we'll see where our denial of God is killing our relationship with Him. And I pray, Lord, that we will, we will recognize that the call of Lent is to deny ourselves. <laughs> deny ourselves, not to deny God or to deny others, but to deny ourselves so that we might be in the right, right relationship with God. That's a positive denial. That's the denial that we all need to latch on to. What can we deny ourselves? What is holding us back in our relationship so that we can truly follow Jesus Christ to the cross, to the grave, and to the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.